A little college football getting rolling here all across the country. We got spring ball, baby. It's Tuesday, March 12th, 2024, the last one on the face of the planet. We're going to make it a great one with Marcus Freeman, the head ball coach out there in South Bend, Indiana for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, joining the show, talking everything from playoff format to how they're crushing it on the recruiting trail in spite of all of the hamstring issues they might have with geography and academic standards. Marcus Freeman heard all that and just went out and got himself a top 10 class two years ago, a number 11 class previously. At the time of us being live, Notre Dame has a top 10 class in the class of 2025. So we had a great conversation with Marcus Freeman, about to show that to you here in just a matter of moments, but it's a leap year. It is in fact a leap year. So with it being a leap year, we thought it would only be appropriate for us to get together here as a little college football community right here on this show, The Hard Count, and take a look at what teams could be set to make a leap in 2024. Got a handful of those teams that I, I feel pretty confident, a pretty confident trend that I think we have for a number of those teams. So we'll give you our thoughts there. And then if you've had your head on a swivel on the recruiting landscape, which, quick plug, if you're not yet subscribed to the On3 Recruits channel, Josh Newberg, Philip Dukes, just crushing it with the content over there, recruiting all year round. Uh, Kalen DeBoer in Alabama, they've been cooking a little bit now. Been cooking a little bit. Just got a big commitment yesterday from one of the top athletes in the class of 2025. So now there's this narrative of, is Kalen DeBoer going to recruit? That's the big question, right? Can he recruit? He's, he's in the SEC. It's not the West Coast anymore. Not in the Pac-12 anymore, brother. Can you recruit with the big boys? Starting to get some momentum. We'll see. We got our, our own take on how this looks right now for Alabama, but make sure you're tuned in there. Then I put a question out on my Twitter page yesterday. This was two days ago. And just said, hey, which quarterbacks would you build around when it comes to your college football team in 2024? Like, everyone likes to talk about the NFL draft and which guys are going to go out and be the face of their franchise. But I wanted to reset that conversation for us in the college football world and say, okay, if you could pick any quarterback for the 2024 season and build your entire team around him, who are you going with? We have a couple of names that y'all threw our way we're going to talk about. We got a couple of names that we would pick in the right context. So that'll be a lot of fun. Excited to get to that conversation here in just a matter of moments. Before we get to that, though, what I said at the top of this thing, man, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. We got spring football. So we'll give you some intel there. Hang tight, though. Make sure you're subscribed. All right? College football all year long. This is the place for you. Okay, we talk college football every single day. We're live three times a week, as we are right now. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern. We have had a ton of the top head coaches in the country join the show and talk some ball with us. I don't think we're done. In fact, a little sneak preview here. We're going to get out on the road here to a couple of campuses and uh, sit down with some coaches, watch some practices, give you some intel from our own vantage point. So lock in for that. Make sure you subscribe. We appreciate y'all in advance for that. All right, let's get right to it, man. Let's take a look across the country. Spring intel. Spring impressions is probably a better term to use for where we're at right now because the intel side of things makes it sound like we got – you know, these, uh, these breaking news headlines, and we got this, you know, really leading narrative for different places across the country. Right now, all these teams that are starting spring football have only had a few practices in helmets. So it's hard to really quantify exactly what you're looking at. It's hard to get a tremendous gauge for what's happening on the field when you're not actually playing the sport to the full extent, which is, of course, in pads. But let's start out there in Columbus, Ohio. Get locked in at Letterman Row. The Ohio State on three site, that entire team over there is crushing the coverage. The overwhelming narrative right now, the overwhelming theme in Columbus, is when you watch this team, even in helmets, this might be the most first team all off the bus kind of squad. Like you look at a couple of these guys, especially some of the transfers, Quinshawn Judkins, Caleb Downs, both individuals coming from the SEC, and they said it just looks like a different football team physically. Now, you're going to hear that said a lot across the country this time of year. Oh, hey, they look bigger. Yeah, because everyone's been in the weight room for the entirety of the winter working their tail off, putting on pounds, so they don't lose all that weight when it comes to the season, getting ready for spring football. But I think there's something to be said here for those two individuals because they come from different places. They come from different parts of the country, and they're now at Ohio State. Think about Ohio State now the last couple of seasons. They've been, they've been really good. Last year's kind of the exception to their standard of, of the level they expect to play at. But the year before, ran into Georgia in the college football playoff. You saw them play Missouri in the Cotton Bowl, and they, they weren't, you know, the fullest power level they were previously at with, you know, the opt-outs they had in that game, most notably Marvin Harrison Jr. But what I'm trying to say here is that's a good sign if you're an Ohio State fan. Hearing that your team looks physically different 
That's the edge that you're going to have to have when it comes to this 12-team playoff. Jeremiah Smith, it's so early on, but we're going to critique and analyze every single thing about him to this point in his college career, which is, of course, all of two practices right now. He was the number one player in 2024. He's six foot three, 215. The reports are he looks like an action figure. And Denzel Burke, per the folks at Letterman Row, say he is one of the most outspoken guys on the team. Of course, I'm speaking of Denzel Burke, who is big-time corner for them. So the, the thought there is, hey, you talk to Denzel Burke, you have a pretty good pulse as to what's going on within the team and within you know the roster as a whole. And they asked Denzel Burke what he thinks about Jeremiah Smith during the bowl practice, before Jeremiah Smith got there. They said, you know what? I'm going to have to see. I, I, I respect the hype. I respect you know the accolades he comes here with, but he's going to have to show me that he is that dude. And they asked him again during fall camp. Again, mind you, we're a couple of winter conditioning sessions and – I think two spring practices in for Ohio State at this point. And Denzel Burke's like, I don't want to you know, give him an un, unattainable title at this point in his college career as he's a freshman, but he should be the next great wide receiver at Ohio State. So if Denzel Burke is saying it, there's some real truth to it. Will Howard, transfer quarterback from Kansas State, ton of excitement around him. The expectation for me, and I'd have to believe a lot of folks in Columbus, is he's going to start at quarterback for you. I don't think you transfer from Kansas State to a place like Ohio State if you don't wholeheartedly believe that. The, the report right now is, after a few practices, he's still getting up to speed. He's still kind of fighting his footing. Now, if you're an Ohio State fan, you're saying, oh boy, did we miss? Did we miss on getting our transfer quarterback? Nobody missed. Remember now, this is kind of how it was with Sam Hartman and Notre Dame, too, really until that spring game where he really separated himself and sort of dropped the mic that he was your guy at Notre Dame. So for Will Howard, there's an acclimation period. You would expect that. It's a new offense. It's a new place. It's a new system. Like, give it some time for Will Howard. We'll, uh, we'll keep a, a pulse of what's going on there for him and for the rest of his, uh, his status there in Columbus. Last thing here, I'm always curious – when we talk to folks close to the program, like, hey, what's the, what's the temperature during spring practice? And when I say temperature, I mean, like, what's the buzz? What's the feel? Is there a certain edge to this team? Is there a certain vibe around this team during the, the, you know, the first couple of practices? Because you can't really make a diagnosis during spring. You can't make definitive statements necessarily off of a couple of practices. But you can get a pretty good gauge for the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is this is a team that understands how much talent they have on the roster. This is a team that understands what they should accomplish. Going back to Denzel Burke now, the truth serum of the Ohio State Buckeye football team, he said, natty or bust. Now, I don't know if you want your all-star corner saying that, but he said it. I think everyone in that team, whether they were going to say it out loud or not, understands that. So that's Ohio State for you. Again, all the coverage at Letterman Row, get locked in over there. Let's go out to Gainesville, Florida. Gators Online, I'm telling you, if you want to stay in the know for all things Gators, Gators Online is going to, going to be the spot for you, the, uh, the Florida On3 site. DJ Lagway, one of the most highly anticipated freshman quarterbacks in Gainesville, I'd venture to say since Tim Tebow, just calling a spade a spade. There's a really healthy mentorship right now between Graham Mertz and DJ Lagway. DJ Lagway, again, the top quarterback in the class of 2024. When I say healthy mentorship, Graham Mertz understands it's his football team. Okay, everybody in Gainesville, not just within that building, but outside of that building, understands it's 15's football team. So with that being the case, there's not this overwhelming pressure that, hey, is he going to lose his job if he throws interception? Is he have to look over his shoulder? Is there this quarterback derby going on? No. Graham Mertz is your leader. And so when you have confidence as a leader, both internally and from your teammates, you have the freedom then to be a little bit more of a assistance to the younger guys. Like he understands now for the future in Gainesville, it's DJ Lagway. So bringing him along, not just with the playbook, but also just how to be a college quarterback. Hey, DJ, when we finish up with our schoolwork, we got to make sure we get back in the film room and watch a couple extra hours of film. That's what it takes to be successful. It's a new rhythm for him, and having someone like a Graham Mertz who's played as much college football as he has bringing him along, I think that's massive. So that's good news if you're a Florida fan. Now on the offensive side of the ball, stay in there. They're looking for another wide receiver to step up for them. Trey Wilson, man, you know what you have in him. He was a stud, true freshman for them a season ago. Going to be a true sophomore this upcoming year. He was a Swiss Army knife. It was very evident in multiple games this year, get the ball to three. Get the ball to three. Let him cook. However, they were able to utilize him to the degree they were because Ricky Pearsall was also on the field for them last year. Now, Ricky Pearsall, God bless him, going to make a whole lot of money in the NFL. So who's that second pass catcher that's going to step up at Florida to kind of take some pressure off Eugene Wilson? Because if you're rolling out there as an offense and you got one guy that can hurt you catching the football, 
it's going to kind of minimize his impact. So is that uh, Aiden Mizell, who's got real deal speed? Is it Andy Jean, who was a four-star cat from last year's class as well? We're going to see. But they got some options there. They got some weapons there. And uh, keep an eye on them. Keep an eye on the Gators online message board to get an idea for how they're coming along. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, some linebackers wearing some black jerseys. Black jerseys, of course, is the non-contact jersey. You got Shamar James out there. That's going to be non-contact. So Miles Graham and Pup Howard, two guys that are going to have a chance now to uh, shred their stuff a little bit. you have a chance to kind of make a name for themselves a little bit more. Both good players in their own right, both unproven to a degree in their own right. They're going to have a chance to kind of uh, make a case for some more playing time when it comes to what they're going to do on the field. Tyler Miles is their new strength and conditioning head coach out there. Folks hear about, you know, buy-in around a, a strength and conditioning coach and say, yeah, of course they're bought in. You have no choice but to buy in. If you're not buying into what the strength coach is doing, you're running, you know, gassers after practice. That might be true, but even with that being said, it's always good to hear that you have buy-in with the new strength conditioning coach. There's also a little bit of buzz that he was the guy that the, the players had originally lobbied for to be the new head of strength conditioning coach. So there's buy-in there. That's encouraging. Last thing I'll say here, going back to temperature, within that team, there is a feeling in Gainesville that that locker room is taking the criticism that Billy Napier is receiving on a personal level. Like, hey, if we take care of business last year as a team, we're not having to deal with these headlines around Billy Napier and around, oh, is he going to be fired? Is he on the hot seat? Like, I think there's a little bit of loyalty there between locker room to coach. And I've said this now for the course of the last year. There is real buy-in between Billy Napier and his team. The way they finished the season, the way they played against Florida State. I understand it wasn't pretty in the win-loss column, but this is a team that plays for Billy Napier. Like, there was never any sign of quit from this Florida team when they had a lot of opportunities, quite frankly, to quit at different points in the year based on what they were or weren't playing for. So keep an eye on that. There's an edge in Florida. There's a little bit of an edge in Gainesville, and I think that's encouraging for the good folks out there uh, going to some games in the swamp. Last team we want to get to here before we get to our conversation with Coach Marcus Freeman, Notre Dame. Again, it's so early on. We're about to get to Marcus Freeman here in just a matter of moments and ask him a lot about spring practice. A little bit of extra juice on the offensive side of the ball. Mike Denbrock coming over from LSU, coming back to Notre Dame, a place he is very familiar with. There was a play that has been talked about a, a good amount on blueandgold.com, so go make sure you check it out. Again, Notre Dame's on three site. Get a membership there. They're crushing the coverage. There's a play in spring practice where low snap, they go on the hard count. Shout out to the hard count. Shout out our, our show title. And the uh, ball is at Riley Leonard's feet. He picks it up, has a free play, throws it deep, touchdown. And Mike Denbrock kind of starts to chirp a little bit. Like, it's one thing when you're a, a player that's chirping and you're letting the defense know. When you're head coach, I should, I should rephrase that. When your coach on that side of the football, your coordinator starts chirping the defense and starts telling them, like, hey, get used to that. That's what we do here now. Get used to it. Get back to the huddle. That's what it's going to be like here. That inspires some confidence. That inspires some real confidence because that's then it's from the top down. It's not from the team all the way up to the coach. It's like, hey, this is who we are now. Get used to that. I'm telling you, man, we say it a lot about other teams, but do not – underestimate the impact that new energy has to a locker room and to a meeting room when it comes to the offensive side of the ball. Uh, Steve, Steve Angeli and Riley Leonard both taking snaps with the ones, kind of 50-50 right now. Same thing we said about Will Howard at Ohio State can be true of Riley Leonard. Give it some time. Give it some time. Riley Leonard, also worth noting, had a, an operation on his ankle, so he's still getting healthy there. I wouldn't read too much into these first couple of days of practice. I fully expect Riley Leonard to be your starting quarterback. We asked Marcus Freeman about that a little bit here in a matter of moments, but just keep an eye on that. I think Riley Leonard could be a guy that separates here once they get into pads, and I don't think they'll ever make him non-contact, or uh, make him contact, rather. I think he'll stay in that red non-contact jersey for Notre Dame, but even with that being said, when you see him get in those game-like scenarios, that's one of the things that Marcus Freeman loves. That's one of the things, rather, that Marcus Freeman loves about Riley Leonard his ability to just be a competitor, to go out there and just get after it with the guys in 11-on-11, 11 11, I think that's where you will see Riley Leonard really start to separate and not so much these routes on air and throwing 7-on-7. Seven seven. Give him time. I think, I think he is going to win the job. Benjamin Morrison, your stud corner for you from a year ago, had a nice one-handed interception during practice, picking up where he left off. The wide receiver room, though, is what's getting a lot of buzz right now. You got some transfers in there. You got Chris Mitchell from FIU. You got Jaden Harrison from Marshall. Jaden Harrison, just food for thought, uh, averaged 30 yards a return last year on kickoff. Y'all, that's ridiculous. He was first-team All-American in that category. 
the buzz right now is the room just looks different from a pace of play standpoint. They look faster. Um, they're going to be a team that I think is more explosive downfield, and they're not even at their full powers yet. They haven't even reached their full form. Bo Collins, transfer wide receiver from Clemson. He's not yet practicing. He's still enrolled at Clemson, but he's living in South Bend. And then Jordan Faison is practicing with lacrosse. So he's not really going through spring practice to the degree that most receivers are. The bottom line here is expect them to be explosive. With Mike Denbrock and this wide receiver room, so far the buzz is very positive. Also, new wide receiver coach Mike Brown bringing some new energy there. So a lot of intel across the board there again. Letterman Row, Gators Online, and blueandgold.com going to keep you in the loop for their respective schools. Get a membership there. It'll stay locked in year-round, especially during spring football. So we had the pleasure to talk a little bit about spring football, talk a little bit about the college football playoff structure, and, and, and talk about his ownership of the new brand that is Notre Dame football with Marcus Freeman. This is a great conversation. I left this conversation, just full transparency, being a massive fan of his and the direction Notre Dame is headed. So without further ado, here's the head ball coach for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Joining us now, the head coach of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, Coach Marcus Freeman. Coach, y'all just started spring football, and you said during your press conference, Mike Denbrock, your new OC, talk a little bit of trash. Now, with you being a defensive guy by nature of your background, are you chirping back at all? Are you mixing it up during the practice? No, no, I love it, man. I'm the head coach now, so uh, I get to support him, man. He talks a little trash, I started laughing. You know, I was back there, he's talking a little trash, and I started laughing like that's the Denbrock that I remember because the problem is I used to be on the other side of the field. So he would talk a little trash. I would scream a little bit back to him. Now, man, when the offense has success, man, I'm the first one rooting for him. So I love it. That's a good deal. That's a good deal whenever the, the OC is talking trash. I guess that means some points are being scored. Amen. Uh, Amen. W when it comes to what you've learned just from year one to now year three, being a head coach in Notre Dame, what would you say your biggest learning point has been? You know, I think every year you learn something different, right? Um, you know, year one, you're just trying to figure it out. You're trying to figure out who you are as a head coach. Okay, these are the templates that other people utilize. What do you want to use? Year two was a big growth on, you know, practice structure. And, okay, this was good and this was bad year one and year two. The details, man, we, we had a, 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 a play that we had 10 guys on the field. How do we go back and make sure those things don't ever happen again? Year three, I, I'm really kind of taking a mindset of, of – you know, being the best version of me, right? And that that how can I be a better head coach? Not just go through the routine of, okay, here's spring practice, here's what we get ready to do, but challenging myself to grow as an individual, what I think will help our entire team be led better, um, maybe a better head coach, but so I've challenged myself and everybody to really, let's be the best version of ourselves, um, which in turn will help us be a better team. And one thing, Coach, that I've really enjoyed hearing you talk about is this mantra of, hey, we're going to challenge everything. We're going to challenge everything. We're going to try and do it to the very best way possible. Where does that come from? It was something that when I was in Cincinnati, as a defensive coordinator, I came up with the mindset of challenge everything, right? And it was a mentality of we're going to be more aggressive and those type of things. But it kind of grew into, you know, it's a lifestyle. How do we challenge everything? How do we um, break the norms? And or – confirm the norms right it's not always find a better way it's like okay confirming what we're doing is the best way and so it's a, a mantra of a never satisfied man atti uh, attitude um that that really kind of permeates for our entire program and it's so funny to hear people talk about notre dame and just these reasons why you can't be successful when it comes to recruiting oh the geography oh the academic standards and you've just heard all those things and gone out and crushed it uh, what's made you such an effective recruiter at notre dame I think you embrace those hard things, right? Is that that I challenge young people and parents like, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. The academics are hard. Um, you're at a place in South Bend, Indiana, that that's not a big, huge city. But uh, most of the times, the great opportunities result from from choosing hard, and and that's what I've kind of really expressed to all the recruits that the, the, the result and the reward from choosing Notre Dame and some of the hard things that it, it really offers you is, is the great success. And so um, I think when people are challenged, they tend to say, okay, this is what I want. Instead of shying away from it, or instead of, you know, just trying to hide it from different people, uh, I truly embrace it. And, and I, and I want the people that choose Notre Dame to embrace it. And I'm sure you're happy to now be back playing football on the grass instead of doing the mat drills and all the winter conditioning. Is there a different temperature when it comes to the spring football for y'all this year, maybe compared to previous years? 
I think every year is different, JD. Right? You take a a group, a different group of players, even different group of coaches, and you say, okay, how do we take these different um, talents and skill sets and mold it into this football team that we all aspire to be? And so, um, really unique challenges. Um, there's no greater joy for a coach than to be out on the grass. I say that all the time. Like that is the relief that we get as a head coach and as coaches to go coach our players. And so we got practice one under our belts. We're going to give them a little bit of time for spring break and then bring them back and then we're going to really be rolling. You mentioned those players, coach, a new, a new player to the scene, uh, Riley Leonard from, from Duke. I know he still has to win the job. What about his game excites you that he brings to South Bend? Competitor. He is number one, just a fierce competitor. I noticed that when we played against him and game plan against him last year, but even being out here this year when uh, he had a, a minor ankle procedure and uh, man, he was just so uh, just itching at the bit to get out there on the field and run. And um, he's an ultimate competitor. He is a, a, a talent. We all know that, man. He's a talent with his legs, his arm, his mind. Um, and, and I'm excited about what he has brought into our offense. Are there any points with a competitor like that where, hey, we got we to gotta kind of pull the reins back a little bit on a guy like this. You know, we got to make sure that for your own safety, you're, you're good to go. Yeah, I think the biggest thing with Riley is for him to focus on, yes, number one, we have to make sure he knows that we're going to limit your reps. We're going to be open and honest beforehand and say, here's the reps you're going to get. And then for him to say, make this rep count. Right. And when you're talking about a quarterback competition, you're talking about not getting all the reps you want. You can tend to let things that really don't matter play into your mind. And so for him, focus on your reps, what you're doing and become a better Riley Leonard, because that's going to make you a better quarterback and that's a better offense. And speaking of offense, I mean, Mike Denbrock, we touched on it a little bit already. But what do you expect from this Notre Dame offense with him now running the show? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of balls being thrown down the field um, on our last practice. And so, uh, you know, Denbrock's not a guy to shy away from taking bombs, taking shots. Um, but also, you know, what our core is still going to be able to run the ball, right? We can't be a finesse offense. we got to be able to run the ball and pound it, which are going to open up some things down the field. But um, Denbrock's not shying away from trying to throw the ball over the defender's heads. And uh, uh, I'm enjoying seeing that. And it seems like a lot of folks have uh, have had a lot of exciting things to say about that wide receiver room, too. I mean, with you know, Bo Collins, I know, isn't practicing just yet, but he'll be in the room. Is there any expectations you have for this group, maybe compared to last year? Well, I think the depth now is, is a little bit different. You're asking, you got about six or seven guys, and, and even you got Jordan Faison, who's doing lacrosse, who's ended up starting at the end of the year for us last year. Um, Bo Collins, as you said, is not practicing yet. Um, it, it, you got guys that, that provide depth and, and the two trainers we have we have here at our practice Chris Mitchell and uh, Jaden Harrison are giving us a downfield threat which is also making those guys around him uh, around them better right and they're they're fresher and uh, I, I really love what coach Brown our wide receivers coach Mike Brown has done with this group um, we just made him we hired him uh, in December of last year as we got ready for the bowl game and, and this room is, has changed tremendously. I mean, I wish I could be within the building there watching those battles between them and Benjamin Morrison and Xavier Watts. I mean, a lot of big guys back on defense. Do you feel like there's a different leadership approach from the defensive side of the ball with all those key guys back? Yeah, you, you lose a captain in J.D. Bertrand who's, who's going to go to the NFL, but um, Cam Hart was a captain for us. But you got some returning starters that are productive, that are all Americans, that, um, man, they, they, they bring a leadership quality just because of what they've done on the field. My challenge to them to be is you got to be outspoken leaders now. you got to lead this team. And, uh, man, they're competitive dudes. Um, there's some great battles, as you just said, in the one-on-one -on -one competition and those type of things. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the ability to hold others accountable, the ability to make our defense better and our team better is the challenge that I have for them all. Now, Coach, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about this. There's, there's not games being played, so everyone's talking about the new things in college football, the playoff format. If I'm a Notre Dame fan, I'm like, hey, with, with our schedule, we're on the table. We, we should get a bye when we get into the playoff. Have you had any conversations with your team or any thoughts around how this whole thing is going to look when we get to 12 teams here next year? Yeah, um, not with our team, but with our administration. Listen, the mindset I have is we do. We have a bye week 13, right? We're playing 12 games straight, and we get a bye week 13. There's two teams in the country that are probably going to get a bye week 14, right? And, and um, there, actually, I know there's four teams, but, but the reality is, is that there's still going to be plenty of teams that don't have a bye. 
right? They're gonna there's gonna be some teams that play in championship games that are gonna make the playoffs that don't get a buy. And so we are guaranteed a buy week thirteen. Control the things we can control, and let's go and uh, take care of the business we can take care of. Well, coach, last question for you. We appreciate all your time. When it comes to Notre Dame, when you took it over, me consuming the sport on social media, I'm seeing the visit pictures start to ramp up a little bit. I'm seeing the cool gold throne. I mean, it, it felt like Notre Dame almost got like a revamp as a brand. Was that something you wanted to do when you took over as head coach? It wasn't to make Notre Dame cool again. Um, I've heard a couple of people say that, but be authentically you, right? And that's who I've always been. And that's what I want this program to be is that, you know what, we can have high standards, high expectations, treat people with respect um, and, and still be ourselves. And, and if the result of that is that, you know, what, we've made Notre Dame cool again, I love it. You know, that's not what I wake up every day and, and hope for. But I think the result of, of being a better, as I said, better version of ourselves, being who we are, um, celebrating these distinctions that we have at Notre Dame, at the end of the day, it will make us cool again. And uh, it's helping us in recruiting. If you're cool, you're not trying to be cool, right? There you go. There it is. Well, Coach, again, thanks for all your time. And uh, can't wait to watch y'all get after it in the fall. Awesome, man. It's been a pleasure. Tell you what, man, I left that conversation being a massive fan of Marcus Freeman, not just because he was nice to us to give us some time, but I mean, just by nature of the way that he talked about things, by nature of the way that he's approaching things from recruiting. He says, hey, we want to recruit guys that embrace what's hard in life and coming to Notre Dame. Yeah, you're going to have to balance academics. You're going to have to balance football. That's a part of the deal. Are you built like that? If you are, come to Notre Dame. Also, the way he talked about Riley Leonard, he's like, listen, we, ha we have to limit his reps and let him know we're limiting his reps. And then the pressure's on him then to make those reps count. Last part, the way he talked about the playoff format, man, if you're a Notre Dame fan, there's probably a certain party that's like, hey, man, let's join a conference. I don't know if you, I don't know if everyone feels that way. Maybe there's a certain part of the Notre Dame fan base that says we should join a conference if this is the way the playoff format's going to be. And Marcus Freeman's like, hey, listen, it is what it is. A lot of teams are going to get a bye. A lot of teams are, are, are going to have no buys when it comes to this college football playoff format. Like, whatever circumstance we have, we got to go make the most of it and handle business. So regardless of how you feel about Notre Dame, joining a conference, not joining a conference, with Marcus Freeman as your head coach, man, I think the future is extremely bright. And I said this yesterday, too. If they have the success that I think they're capable of having, which is, of course, competing at the national level with getting into that, that college football playoff second round and being able to compete for national titles, if they get that done – and they break through the glass ceiling, Marcus Freeman is going to have all the ammunition in the world to go and recruit top talent and build an even more deep roster. So I'm excited to watch them this upcoming season. Marcus Freeman, I wholeheartedly believe, has things headed the right direction over there. And I'll tell you this too. We thought we were special getting him on the show. And then we turn on ESPN. ESPN's got him. Andy Staples had him on the show this morning. So healthy dose of Marcus Freeman for the national media today. And we, uh, we appreciate him including us into that uh, – into that schedule that I'm sure is jam-packed. All right, it's a leap year. It's a leap year. Yep, 2024 is a leap year. So with that being said, it feels like it's only right for us to take a look across the college football landscape and pick out some teams that we think are set to make a leap in 2024. Let's start out here in Blacksburg, Virginia, baby. Va Tech, man, we have been pounding this drum for a minute. They are number one in the country in returning production. They were 7-6 and six in 2023. Tell you what, they're the Hokies, man. Had the hot hand to finish the year. Finished 5-2 and two in their last seven. Kyron Drones also finished very strong. Transferred over from Baylor. Dude is solid. He's a specimen. He ran the ball for 176 yards in the bowl game. Do not be surprised in the slightest now. If the Hokies throw on the Air Jordans, take a nice little jump going from seven wins, I wouldn't be surprised if they won nine football games. The ACC is wide open. You got your favorites. You got Miami. You got Florida State. You got Clemson. A lot of question marks to go with those favorites. So Vatek, I think, a prime suspect to get their leap on in 2024. Let's stay in the ACC. Miami, man. Continuity and quarterback. Those two ingredients are dangerous when it comes to making a jump, and they've been making jumps from year one to year two. Now they go into year three of the crystal ball regime. Just because it hasn't shown up in the win-loss column how you want it to yet doesn't mean it's not on its way. Okay, seven and six last year. I feel like we always have to provide a little asterisk that if they take an either eight and four, it is what it is. But look at what's happened for them. Trust the trend, right? We say that right now when it comes to these you know, teams that can make a leap. Trust the trend. Total offense from year one to year two, 85th nationally to top 25 nationally. Yards per play offensively, 89th 
to 22nd. You're not seeing it in the win-loss column, but you're seeing it on paper start to trend the right direction. Defensively, 54th in the country in rush defense to 11th. It's a nice little leap. Total defense, 64th nationally to 24th nationally. So they're making these massive strides statistically. I think it's only a matter of time before we're able to really capitalize that. I think that's year three. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw this team jump from seven wins to ten wins. No Clemson on the schedule. They get Florida State at home. The U, tell you what, man, if the U, similar to what we've said about Notre Dame and the way that they're trending, if Miami gets some juice and, and has some on-field success, kids are already looking for a reason to go play ball in the 305. I'll tell you that right now. You don't need to make this enormously convincing sales pitch to get a kid to come play football in Miami. We'll leave it at that. Nebraska, they were 5-7 and seven in 2023. For Matt Rule, though, man, if you, if, you, if you trust the trend, there's always that second-year bump for him. At Baylor, they won like one or two games his first year. The second, the second year, uh, they made a bowl game and won a bowl game. Same deal at Temple. One win, two wins his first year. Second, second year, they went and became bowl eligible. Nebraska, though, this isn't just us saying this. This is something Matt Rule has said to us on this very show. It was a different year one for him. Their roster is not at the same ground zero that those rosters were at at Temple and Baylor. So for year two now, I don't think you need to have this massive change when it comes to the way that they do things. There needs to be an adaptation to the way they do things. And what I mean by that is it has to go from, like Matt Rule said, the coach's way to the players in that locker room owning the, the process and the way that the coaches are telling them to do things it has to be player-led. But I don't think they need to have some crazy performance from whoever plays quarterback for them. We've been really transparent. We wholeheartedly believe it'll be Dylan Raiola playing quarterback for them in Lincoln this year. But even with that being said, like he doesn't have to go for 30 touchdowns and five picks. If he just goes for 20 touchdowns and seven picks, that'll be good enough for them to make a jump. So I wouldn't be surprised if this team jumped from five wins into that eight win category. Now, to be clear, the Big Ten is going to be a little bit more tricky this year. Right? You add in the Oregon, the USC, the UCLA, the Washington, it'll be a little bit more difficult. But Nebraska, I think, with Matt Rule, the way that he's done things at different stops, year two is always a bit of a bump here for him. I expect no different for them at Nebraska his second year in Lincoln. Now, a Matt Rule disciple is Joey McGuire. He's the head coach of Texas Tech. And they're sneaky, man. They're sneaky. They won seven football games a year ago. Lots of unquantifiables for them. And when I say unquantifiables, I mean things that don't necessarily show up when you turn on the tape or when you look at the stat sheet, but they do things behind closed doors in a way that's generated sort of this opinion across personnel departments. That is, Texas Tech, the way that they eval is different than a lot of other places across the country. They take on the professional model, which is we have a personnel department, a scouting department, and they're going to go and find the top talent. And when we find that top talent, we will then pass that talent to our linebackers coach, to our receivers coach. And so I say all that to say the folks across the talent acquisition world speak really highly of Texas Tech. And I think it's only a matter of time before we see their eval process that, that folks rave about really translate at a high level to the field. They bring back Taj Brooks, who was a thousand yard rusher a season ago in the Big 12, wide open conference. Same thing we say about the ACC, man. Same deal is true with the Big 12. You just subtract the top two rosters from the conference from a talent level in Texas and Oklahoma gone to the SEC. If Texas Tech is able to build off what they did a season ago, they're going to be in contention to be a 10-win football team. They had three losses last year by one score. Okay, so if you change the narrative on a couple of those, you change a play here, a play there, Texas Tech might have found their way to Jerry World. But right now, I would be hard-pressed to not put them in that game when it comes to that first weekend of December. I'm making our prediction, but that's the way I feel about Texas Tech. Very, very high on them at this point in time. Wisconsin, another 7-6 and six win football team. In year two, you start to see a little bit more of a team take on the personality and the, and the DNA traits of their head coach. Luke Fickle is two things, man. He's tough, wrestling background. His teams have been tough, and he's a winner. He's won 70% of his football games as a head coach, going back to his time at Cincinnati. And there's a lot of continuity in Wisconsin, too. That running back room, you lose Braylon Allen, who's built like Thanos, and that's always going to be tough when you lose someone like that carrying the ball for you. But you bring back Chesma Lucy, who's going to be a stud for you. And you also went out and took a big swing in the transfer portal and went and got Tyler Van Dyke to play quarterback for you. 
Now, his background, we've said it a lot on this show. I think it fits really nicely with that Phil Longo kind of air raid approach. Luke Fickle went from four wins to 11 wins, year one to year two at Cincinnati. The Big Ten is going to be tough, but I would not be surprised if Wisconsin took a two to three win jump as well in his second year in Madison. So, Va Tech, Miami, Nebraska, Texas Tech, and Wisconsin, all I believe should be on leap watch for college football fans all over the country. So let me know who you think are some leap year teams. I think there's a lot to unpack there, a lot of different names to unpack there. We probably could have named Auburn. I think they're on leap year watch. Um, I, I won't go too much further than that, but let me know who you think. Now, recruiting doesn't stop. Recruiting does not stop. And if you've been dialed into the On3 Recruits channel with Philip Dukes, Josh Newberg, keeping you in the know for all things recruiting, then you've kind of stayed up to date here. But if you haven't, allow me to uh, drop some knowledge here. Kalen DeBoer and Bama are crushing it right now. Been on a little bit of heater, okay? They, they kept Ryan Williams, a five-star plus wide receiver for the class of 2024. They flipped four-star defensive lineman Antonio Coleman from Auburn, and they got Derek Smith, number four athlete in 2025 for us at on three. Also, they got Zamir Smith, another big-time athlete in 2025. So the bottom line here is Kalen DeBoer cooking a little bit, cooking a little bit. So what does this mean for Bama? What does it say about the narrative for Kalen DeBoer and company that, hey, is Kalen DeBoer going to recruit? Is he, is he going to be able to withstand the, the standard out there in the Southeastern Conference? We'll talk about it here in a second, but make sure you subscribe. Bama fans, we had a lot of y'all join the party. We're glad to have y'all here. No time like the present to lock in. Okay, this is our time of year. When I say our time, I mean us as junky college football fans. This is the time where the noise kind of dies down around your favorite team. The coverage, the content kind of dies down. Not us here. We're full steam ahead. We're doing as much content as we do during the season. Want y'all locked in right here, so make sure you're subscribed. So here's what I, what I would say about this. Kalen DeBoer, he's, he's doing awesome. He's doing phenomenal. And if this is the level he's going to recruit at in Tuscaloosa, he's going to stay recruiting at this level, grabbing top talent, flipping guys from Auburn, grabbing guys on the defensive side of the ball, getting five-star plus wide receivers to stay at Alabama. Like, that's massive. Absolutely massive. And there's going to be a minimal recalibration period for Alabama. Now, notice, I did not say there's no recalibration period. I did not say they will win multiple national championships. It means that Alabama will stay in a similar era, similar tier that they've expected to stay in the SEC. Because here's the deal. We know Kalen DeBoer can coach. Even when he got hired at Bama, anyone who didn't like the hire didn't say, well, he can't coach football. The question was always, eh, I don't know if he can recruit in the SEC. 104 and 12 as a head coach, he can coach ball. Can he recruit in the SEC? If he can, and this stays the thing for them, then your question's answered. And you know what it is. Then you know who Bama is. You know who Kalen DeBoer is. And you know you're going to have to deal with them every single year. Here's the thing for me, though. For Alabama, the, the question isn't can they recruit at the top 10 level. I think by nature of that logo for the next couple of seasons, they should be able to. But my question is, can he recruit at the top three level? Because that was what made Bama Bama. Yes, Nick Saban is the greatest of all time. There's a reason for that because he typically had some of the best talent across the country. Like, is it the chicken or the egg? I don't know, but Nick Saban prioritized recruiting, right? Like, they had a top three class pretty much every single year he was in Tuscaloosa. So the reason why that's important, if you're recruiting at the top three level, it's great. You're one of the top three teams in the country. It speaks for itself. But if you recruit at the top 10 level, who are you behind, more, more likely than not? Like, if they recruit and they're the number nine team in the country on signing day. That's great, but you're probably behind Georgia, probably behind LSU, probably Texas. Who knows where some of the other teams in the SEC are going to start making some moves. Like Alabama, that's great if you're top 10 in the country, but if you're number five in the SEC, then that's below the expectation of what you've come to enjoy in Tuscaloosa with Nick Saban running the show. So the question isn't, is this going to be you know top 10? It's, are they going to be top three? That's the real question when it comes to Alabama. Now, here's what I would say, too. The verdict on Kalen DeBoer and his ability to acquire top talent, I don't think we're going to know that definitively until year two, year three. Because right now, and Philip Dukes has a really great segment on this on the On3 Recruits channel, Kalen DeBoer, I believe, is recruiting in large part because of what that Bama brand allows him to recruit with. Like, he's recruiting because he's won a lot of games. He, he plays with a really exciting offense. And quite frankly, Bama is still Bama right now. 
Like, Bama's coming off an SEC title and a college football playoff berth. Bama is still Bama in everyone's mind. The reason why I don't think we'll know who they are until year two or year three is what happens when Kalen DeBoer recruits with his Bama, with his product in Tuscaloosa, when they're recruiting behind what he's done on the field. Are they able to still snag top talent and be a top three team when it comes to those on three recruiting rankings? We'll see. But whether it's good or whether it's bad, we're going to have to let it bake a little bit. We're not going to have a definitive answer this upcoming year. Because if they don't get, get the guys that they want to get, it'll be, hey, I'm not sure about Bama yet. Nick Saban's gone. We'll see. If they land top guys, it's going to be because Kalen DeBoer just played for a national title and Alabama has got the juice that it had when Nick Saban was there because he was just there. So all that's to say, let things run their course a little bit. If Kalen DeBoer keeps recruiting at this level, great. If he doesn't, well, then we'll learn a lot more about him as a head coach. and We'll learn a lot more about what Alabama is going to be in the Kalen DeBoer era. So this is encouraging. If this is the preview to the movie and this is going to be the trend they're on over the course of the next couple of years, phenomenal. That's great. You, you really encourage to see them recruit this way. But understand the sample size here is still relatively small. Give it some time. Let it bake. And we'll see where we are here in a couple of years. But, I mean, there's no way to say it. You're, you're always encouraged to grab top talent. You never turn down top talent. Sort of the way that it is. Appreciate everybody dialed in live, man. Make sure you like the video. Make sure you've subscribed. Just helps us do more content that you want to see. One way that I make sure we grab content that you want to see is I post little prompts on my Twitter page, at Jody Paquel. And one of the questions I posed on there that, that I think we're going to do a segment on right now, if you had to pick one current college quarterback to build the rest of your college football team around for the 2024 season, who would it be? It's NFL draft season. Everyone's talking about who they're going to take at number two behind Caleb Williams. Is it Jaden Daniels? Is it J.J. McCarthy, Michael Penix Jr., Bo Nix? We, we appreciate that. Those guys are college football players for us until they get to the NFL. Like, we're, we're still holding on to the college football label. But when it comes to our players that are playing next year in college football, our quarterbacks, who would you build around? Got a lot of really good answers from y'all. I think for me, like, in answering this question, context is key. As in anything, context is always going to be crucial. If I'm running a pro-style system, that's going to be different than if I run a spread system. So if I'm running a pro-style system, I'm taking Carson Beck. Like, he is the definition right now in college football of what a pro-style quarterback is. Is he going to light you on fire with his legs? Probably not, but he's 6'4", 220. He completed 70% of his passes last year. The ball is going to the right place at the right time consistently. And folks say, yeah, well, he had Brock Bowers not the entirety of the season, and that offense still was humming with him under Mike Bobo. This upcoming year, if he takes even another step, Georgia's going to be in the national championship game. We'll leave it at that. Now, if I'm going with the spread offense, Jackson Dart was a thought for me here. I'm going Dylan Gabriel at Oregon. One, because he's thrived across the course of his entire college career. Second part of that, his college career provides a pretty great sample size for me. If I'm picking a quarterback here, six years, three schools, different circumstances, he's still been balling. Okay, he has never thrown for less than 3,000 yards in a regular season. We're including, of course, the fact that the COVID season doesn't count towards that regular season part. So I guess we're excluding the regular season of, uh, of COVID. The bottom line is he's been a baller in every single system. The experience factor that he has, you can't account for. And I love the way that he distributes the football and then also brings that mobile element, okay? In a pro-style system, probably not rolling with Dylan Gabriel. When I spread you out, though, and I play in that Josh Heupel sort of system, that Jeff Levy sort of system that he played at UCF and then again at Oklahoma, I like Dylan Gabriel a lot. I think he's going to thrive this year at Oregon in Will Stein's system. So I got a spread system. I'm going with my guy, DG. Now, if I'm just picking a quarterback based off of where they are right now and I get their entire career for my football program, I'm looking no further than Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'm going with Nico Iamaliava. Nothing physically within his game is going to limit him. Six foot six, 210 pounds. You saw in the bowl game he can take off and hurt you with his legs. He can push the ball downfield. I don't believe there is a higher ceiling for anyone in college football at the quarterback position than Nico Iamaliava. Top player in the 2023 class. You know what you're going to get with him physically plugging him into that system. If I get his whole career now, which is, of course, the context we're operating under for this discussion, I mean, the sky's the limit. The sky is the limit. So if I get someone's whole career that I get to build around, I'm going with Nico. Now, if I want to kind of take a little bit more of a gamble here, and I just want to go and air it out, Shadur Sanders at Colorado, man. His arm talent, 
is as good as, I, as, as there is in the country. And here's the thing. 27 touchdowns to three interceptions, so he made good decisions. Over 3,000 yards, but here's the big part. He got sacked like 50 times. So part of that you're saying, hey, Shadur, let's throw the ball away, brother. Let's get rid of the football. That's part of it. The other part of it, though, is imagine if he had an offensive line. Imagine if he has somebody back there blocking for him for more than two Mississippis. How many yards is he throwing for then? How many touchdowns are we throwing for then? So the arm talent factor and the just big playability with him. If you want to take a gamble a little bit, you want to go with uh, a tremendous TV product for you in terms of kind of offense you're going to run with Shadur Sanders. A lot of points being scored. Shadur Sanders has to be considered on this list. This is the one that maybe is uh, the biggest biggest uh, reward potentially if you are to, to hit at the level I think you can with this kind of quarterback. If he can stay healthy, Quinn Ewers has a very real chance to be the best quarterback in all of college football in 2024. Full stop. Look at the trend for him. First year, wasn't able to stay healthy. Still figuring out the offense, it looked like. Threw for 58% of his passes being completed. He took an 11% jump up to 69%. Same deal, wasn't able to stay healthy. But this, the, the trend that he's on right now, if he improves again, if he's able to have another season and take a step up with, with the talent they lost that wide receiver room, Quinn Ewers, man, could very realistically, when it comes to the NFL circles, I think be the top guy taken in this entire group. So we'll see how that whole thing formulates. There's, you're really trusting the trend there with Quinn Ewers, but I think with what he brings to the table, it's hard to say if I had one season, I needed to win a national championship, any offense, I might go with Quinn Ewers. I might go with Quinn Ewers. So again, whole career I'm going with Nico. Pro-style offense, give me Carson Beck. We're spreading it out. A little RPO system, we're going up-tempo. I'm going with the dude who's done it for six years in Dylan Gabriel, then Shadur Sanders. The arm talent is freakish. Have to think about him in this conversation. And Quinn Ewers, like I just said, has a chance, I think, to be the best quarterback, period, in the 2024 college football season. So let me know, man. Let me know what y'all think about that. Let me know who you would take when it comes to who you would build your team around in 2024. Appreciate y'all being dialed in, man. Typically, we'd have a question and answer period of this show right now. We're going to have that for you tomorrow. Big show tomorrow, okay? Make sure you're locked in. Make sure you're subscribed. This is, like I said, the part of the year where we as college football fans differentiate ourselves. You have your folks that tune in September to December, and that's fun. They, they enjoy the sport. But the real, real fans that easily can breathe this stuff, this is a year-round deal for us. Message boards. I just gave you a ton of message boards you can go tune into. Get a membership app under the On3 umbrella. Whatever your favorite team is, more likely than not, there's a message board for that. There's a site for that. Make sure you're locked in right here on the On3 YouTube channel. This show, The Hard Count, live three times a week with content for you every single day. We appreciate the heck out of you. We're grateful you watched this show. We're grateful you're a part of this. We love y'all, and we're going to keep this party rolling, man. We will see y'all next time.